How to visualize the zeta function on the complex plane. Try to think every part in the series as a vector of magnitude 1 over k to the s rotated through an angle theta equal minus y over ln k. I will give you a few seconds to process all of this. Please pause the video if you need more time. If you already know all of this or got it then let's proceed. Convergent points The simplest way is to first look at the complex plane and the behavior of convergent points where the real part of zeta is bigger than 1. The spiral swirls around inwards to an unique point which the series converges. As you can see this simple animation illustrates just that. This is an animation of the first 1000 steps for the point 1.1 plus 1.8i. It converged to the point 0 0.63 minus 0 0.42i. When I first started to read about the zeta function, I didn't know what those assigned values or analytic continuation were, and how and why people are trying to give a value for divergent series and why that specific value and not something else. I wanted another explanation without going deeper into all the analytic continuation stuff. An explanation that will be a much more simpler. Those origin points did the trick. The simplest origin point to understand is the eta minus 1 function, which equals 2, 1 minus 2 plus 3 minus 4, etc. The assigned value 1 quarter is not the summation of the eta minus 1 function. It simply represents the intersection points of the two lines or as I like to describe it as the origin point of the spiral on the complex plane. Divergent points As you saw before where the real part of zeta was bigger than 1 the spiral swirled around inwards to an unique point which the series converges. But the same goes the other way around. When I look at the complex plane and the behavior of divergent points where the real part of zeta is smaller than 1 the spiral swirls around outwards. But if you look closely you will notice that the spiral has a center point or an origin. And that origin is the assigned value everyone is talking about. People are used to assign a value to a series if the series decreases to a specific value only when the summation direction is from left to right. Try to think about all the analytic continuation part as a way to reverse the summation direction and try to find the origin point from where the series diverged. If you are assigning a value for a series that decreases to a specific value, then you can also assigning a value for a series that increases from a specific value. When the series increases from a specific value this is what I like to call an origin point. Let's call case number 1 when a series decreases to a specific value. And case number 2 when a series increases from a specific value. Other than those two cases there is one more. This special case is when the spiral at some point start to spin around a specific value with a fixed radius. Those cases appears at the zeta function when the real part of zeta is equal to 1 and the radius will be 1 over the imaginary part. Meaning that this is a divergent series with a fixed radius. Zeta 1 is a special case when the spiral at some point should have started to spin around a specific value with a fixed radius. But the imaginary part is equal to 0. Meaning that the radius will be 1 over 0 which is undefined. And that is why you can't assign a value to Zeta 1 because the analytic continuation is undefined at that point. You can also think about zeta 1 as a spiral with an infinite radius which make the center point to go out of range. This is why the spiral never starts to spin around and the angle stays fixed on zero. Making zeta 1 only to have one direction and that is straight on the real part axis. Which is a nice way to view the harmonic series. 
convergent points. Eta function. It's true that the zeta function spirals have three cases, but they are all spirals with one arm. Now on the eta function, the spirals have two arms with the same three cases. This is case number one. The spiral swirls around inwards to an unique point which the series converges. The eta function has two arms because of the plus minus swapping. Divergent points. Eta function. Let's look at the behavior of divergent points where the real part of eta function is smaller than zero. As you can see this simple animation illustrates just that. And also gives us a visual confirmation that because of the plus minus swapping the spiral has two arm swirls around outwards from an unique point. As I shown before when the zeta function real part were one was a special case this next case of eta function is also a special case. This case happens when the spiral at some point start to spin around a specific value with a fixed radius. Those cases appears at the eta function when the real part of zeta is equal to zero. Meaning that this is also a divergent series with a fixed radius, just like before. Let's summarize all six cases. Case number one, the zeta function has convergent points where the real part of zeta is bigger than one. Case number 2, the zeta function has divergent points where the real part of zeta is smaller than 1. Case number 3, the zeta function has divergent points with a fixed radius where the real part of zeta is equal to 1. Case number 4, the eta function has convergent points where the real part of zeta is bigger than 0. Case number 5, the eta function has divergent points where the real part of zeta is smaller than 0. Case number 6, the eta function has divergent points with a fixed radius where the real part of zeta is equal to zero. Let's look at the zeta function for a moment. As you can see the right side is the convergent side of the function. And the divergent side is out of range so to speak. Meaning that all the spirals converge to unique points all over the line on the right side. And on the left side all the spirals diverged out of range but as I showed you before, the origin point of the spiral on the complex plane was the analytic continuation of all the diverged spirals. Meaning that now we can assign a well-defined unique value to every spiral on the left side as well. Except of course zeta 1. This is how the analytic continuation looks like. This analytic continuation line represents the center points of all the divergent spirals of the left side. Now let's look at the eta function as well. Same as before. You can see that the right side is the convergent side of the function. And the divergent side is out of range again. We know now we can assign a well-defined unique value to every spiral on the left side. This is how the analytic continuation looks like. This analytic continuation line represents the center points of all the divergent spirals of the left side. Gamma function. I'm not going to elaborate on the gamma function. The only reason I'm showing the gamma function is because I'm going to show the functional equation next. Only two general thing we need to know. The first one is that the gamma function is commonly used as an extension of the factorial function to complex numbers. The second one is that the gamma function cannot be equal to zero by any complex number. The functional equation zeta of s equal to 2 to the s pi to the s minus 1, sine of pi s over 2, gamma of 1 minus s, and zeta of 1 minus s. The functional equation was established by Bernard Riemann in his 1859 paper, on the number of primes less than a given magnitude, and used to construct the analytic continuation in the first place. This humongous equation is in simple words a way to show us the link between the real part of zeta function and the analytic continuation part. 
meaning, we can use the convergent side values to find the corresponding analytic continuation value on the divergent side by this equation. Let's do a little demonstration. Let's first go back to the zeta function. Before we begin there is an important thing we need to clarify. The functional equation extends the convergent side as a reflection through the critical line which is located where the real part of the zeta function is one half. Meaning, if point s distant from the critical line is x, then, its corresponding analytic continuation point, distant from the critical line will be x as well, but on the other side to the critical line. For example, let's take point zeta, 6. Zeta 6 is equal to pi to the 6 over 945. Zeta 6 distant from the critical line is 5.5. So, its corresponding analytic continuation point, distant from the critical line will be minus 5.5 meaning the location of zeta 6 corresponding analytic continuation point will be at point zeta minus 5. But what is the analytic continuation value of the point zeta minus 5? Now let's go back to the functional equation. We will use the functional equation to find the analytic continuation value of the point zeta minus 5. First let's replace the variable s with the value minus 5. And now let's substitute pi to the 6 over 945 instead of zeta 6 minus 1 instead of sine of minus 5 pi over 2 and 120 instead of gamma 6. And we will get zeta minus 5 equal to minus 1 over 252. The reason I'm showing you this is because I would like you to first visualize the formula and not just to understand it. And also so you can see that every value of zeta function that is right to the critical line have a corresponding counterpart left to the critical line with the same value multiplied by some other value. This fact is essential for later on when we will talk about the critical line and its zeros. Zeta function zeros Let's take a look at the functional equation again. 2 to the s pi to the s minus 1 cannot be equal to 0 by any complex number. And also gamma function cannot be equal to 0 by any complex number. Let's focus now only on the parts of the functional equation that can be equal to 0. Leonard Euler proved the Euler product formula for the zeta function in his thesis, Various Observations About Infinite Series, published by St. Petersburg Academy in 1737. The Euler product formula shows that zeta function has no zeros for real part of s greater than 1. Like I explained earlier, the functional equation extends the convergent side as a reflection through the critical line which is located where the real part of the zeta function is one half. Meaning, that every point s that is right to the critical line with a value zeta s have a corresponding counterpart left to the critical line at point 1 minus s, with the same zeta s value multiplied by some other value. Thus, the zeta function has no zeros for real part of s smaller than zero as well, except for when sine of pi s over 2 is equal to zero. When s is a negative even integer then sine of pi s over 2 is equal to zero. And because it's easy to find those zeros they are called the trivial zeros. Side note. If you will use for Haber's formula and express the sum of the n powers of the first s positive integers. And will also write them in the right way plus a little correction for Bernoulli numbers as well then you will get this marvelous result. If you look closely you will see the analytic continuation values on the start of the formula, including the trivial zeros I just showed you as well as the analytic continuation values for negative odd integer. Here is my zeta function advanced mode table for integer powers. And here is my eta function advanced mode table for integer powers.
Let's go back to the zeta function. We showed that zeta function has no zeros for real part of s greater than 1 and for real part of s smaller than 0 except for when s is a negative even integer. But what about when s is between 1 and 0? In 1896 the prime number theorem was proved using ideas introduced by Bernard Riemann. In particular, that the Riemann zeta function has no zeros on the line, real part of s equals 1. Meaning that the only region there could be non-trivial zeros is when real part of s is between 0 and 1. Also known as the critical strip. The critical strip. When we talked about the functional equation I showed you that every value of zeta function that is right to the critical line have a corresponding counterpart left to the critical line with the same value multiplied by some other value. I now want to add also that every value of zeta function that is above the real number axis have a corresponding counterpart below the real number axis with the same value. Meaning that if you found a zero point on the critical strip that is not on the critical line then you automatically have another three more location of zero points on the critical strip as well. The critical line Riemann hypothesized that all of the non-trivial zeros sit right in the middle of the strip on the line of the number s whose real part is one half. If all the non-trivial zeros actually lie on the real part of s equals half line, then the error term between the prime power counting function and the logarithmic integral function will be as small as possible. Please notice how the half line passing through the number zero, again and again. Godfrey Harold Hardy proved in 1914 that an infinity of zeros were on the critical line. I would like to point out that this animation of the critical line you just saw was made by analytic continuation points of the zeta function. Meaning that all the spiral's origin points are zero but this is not a real value of zero but analytic continuation zero. Those spiral swirls around outwards, and their center point is zero. On the next chapter I am going to show you how you can use a real value of zero and also remove the Riemann hypothesis from the complex plane. Stay tuned.